Welcome, folks. We're getting organized. I think we'll start soon. Uh, despite what the screen says, it is 2023. Well, maybe I'll just jump in then. Uh, we're very fortunate to ha tonight to have Will Keeley with us. He's the uh, senior wildlife ecologist with City of Boulder Open Space and Mountain Parks. And um, he uh, attended CU and he did his um, master's degree on raptor biology, specifically on um, ferruginous hawks in New Mexico. And some of you may have seen that talk. It was at the Ecosystem Symposium when it was held in Ramele um, in the biology building on the CU campus. This was a while ago, but I remembered it. And um, he has been with Open Space and Mountain Park since 1999 and then more formally since 2006. He's in charge of raptor habitat as well as bats, uh, amphibians and bird habitat management. And then I'd like to tell you a fun story about Will. I've been out uh, small mammal trapping with him uh, because of my interest in Preble's Meadow jumping mice. And so I got to hear a story that he, he confirmed was true. So one time when they were trapping, because it's all hands on deck, small mammal trapping is very uh, labor intensive. And uh, so he came up to one uh, Sherman trap. They're about this big uh, metal live trap. And uh, he saw that there was a dark tail sticking out of the door. So he was able to figure out pretty quickly what he was dealing with. He was dealing with a Western spotted skunk. <laughs> and he knew that this was going to be tricky to open the trap. So he told me that what he did was he put on his rain jacket and some gloves. And yes, he got skunked. But what good humor he had about it. He said it only took a couple of days. <laughs> So without further ado, let me introduce Will Keeley. This is a clip on that, so I wasn't quite sure. Should we confirm the care of hear me on this one too? Can, can you give a thumbs up if you can hear me on this one? We can hear you. Oh yeah, sorry. Okay, great. Hi, everybody. Thanks. Uh, yeah, um, I was thinking it only took me a few days to get used to it. I'm not quite sure how long it took my family to get used to the spotted skunk smell on my clothes. Um, but uh, thanks for coming out. I'm happy to be here uh, talking about raptors and a couple of uh, new projects that we've been working on with um, recording acoustic sound in on open space in mountain parks. So just a little bit of background on um, OSMP. No, I'm quicker. Oh yeah, I, th I think Michael kind of figured out that this clicker worked and it did up until right now. Michael, do you have any ideas? Oh, okay. Maybe I just got to press differently. Okay, so uh, just start with an outline, just so you know where we're heading here. First, just talk about raptor ha habitat management and some of the ecology and, and nesting success and reproductive output on raptors on open space. And then these uh, two projects that we've been working on um, just in the past few years about um, recording sound that we're really intrigued on in, in terms of a, maybe a, a new method to um, not just document ambient noise on open space and its potential impacts on wildlife, but also this kind of new emerging uh, metric, which is these bioacoustic um, diversity indices that came out of National Park Service monitoring that I'd like to kind of talk to you a little bit about. Um, so OSMP is the green stuff surrounded uh, city of Boulder. It's about 46,000 acres. Um, and it's a mixture of grasslands and forest, um, almost, almost split evenly. And, you know, as the front range population has increased, as you've all seen um, firsthand, you know, our visitation has, has concomitantly increased. And so we had about a one third increase from 05 to 17, which is um, the last... Uh, 
the most recent uh, visitor use visitation study that we did. And again, we're going to do that in 22 and 23. So we'll have some updated numbers on that. But OSMP gets more uh, annual visits than um, Arches, Gettysburg, and Grand Teton National Parks combined, uh, just with 46,000 acres. So we we have a we have a lot of use. Um, but we also have some really cool habitat. And so trying to kind of balance not only the increase in, in recreational rock climbing and its importance, um, it's, it's, um, um, its popularity, especially since COVID hit and, and everybody's trying to get out, but also try to manage raptor habitat. And so it's one of these interesting situations of you know, our uh, multi-purpose mandate, which is to provide recreational opportunities and protect and conserve habitat, that really is an interesting uh, case study and, and a really um, a really good heart, heartwarming um, story on um, being able to manage wildlife effectively and still provide high quality recreational opportunities, especially um, uh, rock climbing. So here's a couple of shots of the flat irons. Um, you know, obviously some really good raptor. Um, so we manage habitat for seven species of raptors, um, bald and golden eagles, uh, peregrine and prairie falcons, as well as burrowing owls, osprey, and northern harriers. And all of these um, species are, except for osprey, are either considered tier one or tier two species of special concern by the uh, State Wildlife Action Plan, the SWAP, which was completed by CPW in 2015, as well as a species of special concern in the Boulder County Comp Plan. So um, besides osprey, they're all um, sensitive. They're all species of greatest conservation need, and, and we manage them to limit disturbance caused by humans. So what protections do these species have? Well, the bald and golden eagles have uh, protections and their nests have protections under the Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act, a federal, a federal regulation, as well as the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. All, all birds in their nests are protected under uh, the, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Um, CPW also has raptor buffer guidelines that we, we, we certainly use in um, delineating buffer boundaries, closure boundaries around some of these rock formations. And so all three of these, as well as some professional um, um, experience and use of territory and watching these birds and understanding kind of what they need in order to kind of limit disturbance to them during the nesting season. We came up with and, and have followed um, guidelines in terms of uh, seasonal closure time periods. And so these again are, are to protect these nesting raptors from human caused disturbance. And so here you'll see our date ranges for uh, peregrine and prairie falcons, uh, golden eagles we've moved from they used to start in uh, Golden Eagle closures, used to start on city open space on February 1st, but we were, we were finally able to move that to December 15th this year. So that was a, a, a big win, especially for eagles that are now occupying their territory earlier and earlier in the year, um, as well as not really, this year was a little different, but usually not really having that snowpack to kind of protect that habitat in January and mid-December. So. Again, during the three years of, of COVID, we were seeing a lot of a lot of people in, in a lot of different places because they were kind of going off the beaten path. And this was one of the impetuses um, for uh, moving the closure from uh, February 1st to December 15th for, for Golden Eagles. Osprey and Northern Harrier have the same closure dates, uh, bald eagles and, and burrowing owls. And largely these dates coincide with um, CPW Raptor bu uh, buffer temporal guidelines. But also just in our experiences, um, these dates really line up with birds showing up on their territories, becoming territorial, and then dispersing from their from their natal areas. Um, so the seasonal closures are for both visitors and staff. Um, there are exceptions for staff for monitoring uh, these species, as well as uh, veg management staff for treating a list um, weed species, invasive weeds. So. When that, when that needs to happen near an act, active nest, an occupied nest, uh, we usually as wildlife staff um, are out there watching the birds for any sort of reaction to veg management staff out there um, uh, removing invasive species. 
So it is it is important that and and we haven't had to close a designated trail as any of the in any of these instances for um, for seasonal raptor closures and I think that's important um, because there's there's a lot of um, I think understanding that that gains for uh, the public that we're paying close attention to this and we're not doing blanket closures um, which you know obviously. Um, you know, our use pattern of 6.3 million visitors would irk um, and um, impact a, a lot a lot of visitors. So we don't close any designated trails we haven't had to yet. I mean, it's, I'm, it's not to say that we won't, um, but we haven't felt the need to at this point. So just a little bit of program history with our cliff nesting um, raptor program. It started in 86 with the first closure at Skunk Canyon which BCNA and Boulder County Audubon Society was, was pretty instrumental in, in, in um, implementing. Um, and our, our most recent new closure was in 2020 when we found a new peregrine nest on a rock formation called the Apostles. So um, it's been quite a, quite a long um, uh, addition and subtraction because these falcons do move from site to site. In the beginning um, and, and throughout, we've had extensive community support, um, both from the climbers, the, the local access fund um, factions, the Flatirons Climbing Council and the Boulder Climbing Community bo were both supportive of moving the Golden Eagle closure from February 1st to December 15th, which was which was really important for us because we're such, we, we are good partners with the climbing community and do work with them pretty closely on, on these seasonal closures to, minimize impact to their um, use. Um, obviously, OSMP visitors, um, OSBT, Open Space Board of Trustees, City Council, uh, both BCNA and Audubon Society, as well as Colorado Parks and Wildlife have really supported our seasonal closure program. Um, and so much so that comparable um, land management from other agencies like Forest Service, BLM, National Park Service, and other municipalities, I get calls from Marin County, open space and and those types of open space programs that are looking towards us as as city open space that have kind of gone around the block a few times like this before for advice on how to implement new programs in their open spaces and so now i mean from 86 when city of boulder i think was the first one to implement a seasonal raptor closure to now um there's there's seasonal closures in in all 50 states according to the access fund um, so just diving into um, open space stuff here. So this is kind of an, an aerial view of the flat irons. Um, you'll see, um, let's see, NCAR up here, just for reference, um, Chautauqua up here. But so this is um, kind of a, a, um, a depiction of both golden eagle nest and falcon nest to kind of give you an idea of how stacked up they are in the flat iron. So here we see golden eagle nests or what used to be golden eagle territories a couple of years back in blue and falcon nests or falcon territories in red. And this is just to kind of give you an idea of how dense they are nesting um, in the flat irons. So um, this, is an, this is an interesting one for us because um, you know, if, if we're following CPW's guidelines, and they are guidelines, um, they recommend a half mile buffer around um, occupied um, eagle and falcon nests. And so that that you see in, in the blue circles here is what we would manage as closed if we were to put a half mile buffer on every falcon and, and golden eagle nest on open space in mountain parks. And and that would that would that would more or less close all of the flat irons. And so what, what we've done is use um, the half mile buffer as a guideline, but then use things like view shed. So where does the nest face? Does the nest face due west? And thus you don't need 200, uh, sorry, um, a half mile is 800 meters on the west side of the nest because the bird is facing east or facing west. And so what we've tried to do is tailor our, um, our closure areas based on topography, based on view shed of where the bird is looking on the cliff side, um, and our observations of what the birds are roosting on, what they're perching on to kind of generate 
a polygon that is suitable for their um, habitat needs and, and minimize disturbance to them. Um, we've also visited with climate, the climate community to just to kind of make sure that we weren't unknowingly closing anything that we didn't know that we wanted to close. You know, there's a lot of use in the flat irons with climbers, with boulders, you know, and sometimes you can draw this closure polygon that cuts off an access trail to somewhere that we, we, didn't, we didn't need to do that. So we do run these by the climbing community and say, this is kind of what we're thinking. Is there anything that we're missing so that we can kind of keep that partnership going? So usually um, annually, we close about 1,100 acres um, through 10 to 14 closures. Um, and that is done almost, that is done on an annual basis based on those, those time for uh, those beginning dates, February 1st for Falcons and um, 1215 for, for Golden Eagles. And, and right now I'm just showing you the, the cliff nesters. So they're very, some are very small. Um, the one in Sanitas is only about three, eight, three acres. So was the one on Bear Creek Spire up here, only about three acres. Um, and some of them are quite large, like some on Shadow Canyon that, that are 250 acres. Um, but in, in kind of doing the math in terms of the climbing formations that are, that are still open uh, year round, about 75% of the climbing formations are, are open and only 25% are closed. So again, that kind of builds us a little bit of political capital in terms of managing these um, adaptively. So we do abide by the five-year rule such that we close um, an area five years after the first nesting attempt so that the area is protected when the birds return. And that's a common raptor ecology, raptor biology management um, paradigm is to close it for five years after the first nesting attempt. And so if there's five consecutive years of no nesting, then we would open it. We wouldn't begin it closed on, on the sixth year. So here's a little bit of uh, outreach because that's really important um, for us as managers to relate to visitors, um, just to get the word out that we are closing um, these areas. And the message is somewhat complicated, and I'll, I'll show you a few a few examples of that. Just with with a lot of our um, regulations and trying to be adaptive and meet in the middle and um, achieve that multi purpose mandate, we we sometimes have so many different messages on a closure sign that it, that it gets somewhat confusing. But um, so you'll see a couple of things here. Uh, this is uh, the Shadow Canyon closure. Here we have closed um formations in a white diamond we have open climbing formations in a green diamond so even though the maiden here is right adjacent to the shadow canyon closure it's open but it's only open from the east because you can't you can't access it from the west because you'd be going right through the closure and so some of these nuances are really subtle to the average user but the climbers know exactly what to do and so you know, not only do we depict this as open uh, with the green diamond, but it's accessible from the east. We also have a message that the Shadow Canyon Trail remains open because sometimes it looks like it's closed um, based on the polygons of the closures. And we do get calls here when um, when a regular visitor um, sees these to see, you know, to to is the Shadow Canyon Trail open or closed because it's tough to see from this map. And so we do have these, these kind of um, uh, unique messages on our closure maps. Um, social media, we try to do that, um, as well as having a different sign. So these would be kind of a sign at a reg board. This would be sign kind of um, at the boundary with no access beyond this point so that we have multiple layers of uh, warning to the visitors. Here's another quick example. Um, where we have a, a falcon closure that begins on February 1st and a golden eagle closure that begins on uh, December 15th. Um, so just to kind of get that, that message out that even though there's multiple poly closure polygons in this one map, we are trying to kind of um, relay the message that they're different time frames. And again, just another example of... Um, uh, area behind this sign is closed. Uh, sometimes we ha this would be a climbing access trail here. Sometimes we have to so um, hang cable signs uh, to further delineate the boundaries because it does get tough to hang stuff on trees all the time. 
So just a couple of ways at, that we try to outreach to um, to visitors to get the the message clear. And so you'll see on these closure signs, we also now have the new URL that we purchased um, and um, and keep up to date that has all um, current wildlife closures depicted on an interactive map that you can uh, Google and go osmpwildlifeclosures.org that you can click through all the climbing formations that allow you to say, or allow you to um, determine whether it's whether it's open or closed, closed being red in this um, shot and, and green being, being open. So the role of volunteers in this program is really undeniable. There are eyes and ears out there. Um, Neil's volunteered with us for quite some time. Um, we usually have between 30 and 40 volunteers um, and, and they, they consistently log and we log more than 2000 hours of volunteer time watching, um, watching these closures, watching these territories. And what it does is it provides us really important information for territory occupancy such that we can lift closures on unoccupied territories. And we usually do that around May 15th. And this is just kind of a rundown of what we've been able to lift early based on staff and volunteer effort to determine that the territories aren't occupied. And again, this, this provides the, the public an opportunity to better understand that we're keeping an eye on these territories. And if they're not occupied, they're not gonna be closed all summer. So you know, the climbers would have, you know, from May 15th through the summer to climb. Um, we've also extended seasonal closures. And again, I can't um, underscore enough the importance of getting that message out to the climbing community because they really do a good job of self-policing. Um, we've had to extend, you know, the third flat iron, which is a destination climb for two weeks to allow peregrine falcons the opportunity to nest because they re-nested one year. So, you know, we do lift closures early, but we've also had to extend seasonal closures well into August to allow the, the falcons to successfully nest. So um, just diving into some of the data, you know, the volunteers have collected a long, long-term data set. And it's pretty cool to kind of look at, um, you know, 30 years worth of raptor data. Um, here you'll see two time periods that I split out um, just kind of because it was clean from 1990 to 2000, then 01 through 15 to start off, us off. And so number n, n per year is number of nesting attempts per, per year. Um, nesting success is in red, which is the number of nesting attempts that at least fledged one young. And then the productivity is the number of fledglings divided by the number of nesting attempts. So these are common raptor ecology metrics just to see how population are, are trending and, and doing. Um, and what you'll see, um, at least in these two time periods, is some uh, really good uh, similarities, a stable population. And not only a stable population, but also one that rivals really some comparative measures um, from the Snake River Birds of Prey National Conservation Area in, in Southwest Idaho that is world renowned for um, you know, providing high quality raptor habitat. So you know, if you were just kind of looking at this, you'd see, um, you know, the number of nesting attempts per year for prey falcons increases, you know, almost 40% from one period to the next. Peregrines kind of similar, golden eagles increase. But um, what's kind of cool is looking at the productivity and especially the productivity of um, prey falcons and golden eagles from the Snake River and comparing it to what's in your backyard here is really um, is, is better. Um, you know, obviously there, there are different number of nesting attempts. For instance, you know, prairie falcons in the Snake River have 140 nesting um, attempts per year. So it's a different scale altogether, um, but certainly something to kind of keep an eye on as, um, you know, as we grow, uh, as we move past um, our current period. I did want to then point out then what's kind of been a little, um, interesting the past five, five, four or five years is just the, the decrease in productivity of prairies and, and peregrines, um, as well as golden eagles. Um, and and we, don't, we don't really know what's going on here. We do see like um, the peregrines have increased their nesting attempts per year, almost doubled from two and a half to almost five, whereas the prairies have decreased. And that's a trend that we're seeing a lot of in the Western US 
um, just in talking with other other land managers is peregrines are doing quite well and they and they might be starting to outcompete prairies, which is um, somewhat alarming um, because peregrines are are uh, more um, um, aggressive and prairies do arrive on nesting grounds earlier. And so prairies kind of set up shop, they think they have a great spot and then peregrines come in and, and kind of um, disrupt um, their nesting success. So yeah, this is, this is a little worrisome to see from the 50% nesting success um, from 88 to 69 to 50. And so, you know, we're gonna keep an eye on, on this for sure. Um, there's now a, a prairie falcon working group that the uh, the actual members of the peregrine front fund um, ironically have have set up in the western U.S. to kind of get a better idea of what prairies are doing in Nevada and range wide Utah Colorado uh, Idaho. So that's 16 to 21, and I didn't have time to integrate 22 into that. So I just wanted to show you what 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 happened last year. And again, we didn't have any net successful nesting attempts for peregrines or prairies um, last year. And, you know, last year was a tough year with weather. So it was 21. We had late snow and that eight, that late April heavy snow really um, impacts um, falcons because they, they tend to nest on uh, cliffs, on crevices and not kind of in, in potholes that are, or under roofs like golden eagles that are more protected. So more to come on, on this, but you, you do see like the peregrines are staying at five nesting attempts and the prairie was, was only at one last year. So a little bit disconcerting in terms of a prairie falcon um, activity. Um, this is just a quick um, comparison of the density that I showed you um, with open space and Southwest Idaho and California in terms of falcons. You can just kind of see that linear density measurement that I had, which is the number of linear kilometers divided by the number of nesting of pairs, and uh, just an idea of you know how 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 well we're doing in terms of density of falcons. Now, this is a little old because we don't have um, we we may have six breeding territories or seven now, but but largely peregrines are really starting to to increase. And then uh, this is just another quick metric of density of, you know, numbers of um, kilometer squared per pair of golden eagles. And you can see how um, our stuff or the stuff on, on city open space, the eagles, the golden eagles on city open space are, um, are nesting at a much denser, densi, denser um, population than in Wyoming and Southwest Idaho. So, there seems to be in Wyoming and Southwest Idaho, the habitat's a little different. It's all kind of butte country and then open grasslands as opposed to this kind of raptor condominium that is the flat irons. Um, so just moving on to grassland raptors, because I know we do have some um, fans of owls, burrowing owls and Northern Harriers. Um, this is just a quick one of, of osprey nesting productivity, just to kind of give you an idea of their increase um, in, in the area since 05. Uh, fledgling count in green on the upper and then blue is the number of nesting attempts and the number of successful nesting attempts. So increasing, we're still finding new um, osprey. As, you, as most of you know, they do um, tend to do quite well on artificial nesting structures. And so when there is a new nest on, on, a, on an Excel live line, Excel is really, really quick to get out a platform so that they don't electrocute themselves and 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 compromise the the uh, the elect the electrical line and because of that um, they do move onto these artificial nesting structures these platforms quite easily. Um, so burrowing owl nest, uh, nesting data that we've been collecting since 08, um, we'd had quite a year um, between 17, 18, and 19, and then really haven't seen um, a lot of burrowing owl activity and nesting success on city open space. Now, on, on Boulder County open space, it, it may have been different. I've yet to kind of um, co uh, combine our data, which would be kind of a, a cool thing to do for, for a program in the future. But, you know, it, it does seem like um, some of the drought stuff is starting to catch up with, with burrowing owls, at least on city open space. And then the Harriers too, again, you know, and it does follow the same, the same pattern that we've seen with, with burrowing owls is the struggles from 
going from 2020 through 21 and 22. Um, you know, our Harriers are, are quite sensitive to, to disturbance and um, whether they're, it's coyote based um, and, and, you know, they're ground nesters. Um, we just don't know what what is going on with with the Harriers in on city open space. And again, this would be good to to combine with Boulder County open space um, numbers just to to see what what it looks countywide. Um, so just the, in terms of the habitat management and and largely from the cliff nesters because it does seem like they're doing a little bit better than the grassland raptors um, as as opposed to um, except for bald eagles that seem to be doing quite well countywide. Um, you know, it does seem like in terms of seasonally, seasonally closing the cliffs to limit human disturbance, as well as kind of protecting their foraging habitat, um, a lot of these, um, a lot of these falcons and eagles are benefiting from protecting the grassland habitat too. Um, prey dog colonies for the eagles, as well as, as foraging grounds for, for the falcons. Um, this was a, a maximum extent of prairie dog um, colonies um, on open space. And, you know, even though the peregrine falcons and the prairies don't eat, um, eat um, prairie dogs, they do benefit from um, the open space that, that the prairie dogs are, are holding on to. You know, prairie falcons will eat 13 uh, line ground squirrels and things that are associated with, with prairie dog colonies. They won't, they might take a small pup of a prairie dog, but you know, peregrines are bird eating birds, and so they're largely taken, um, they're largely taken birds. So, you know, protecting habitat while still um, providing these high uh, quality recreational opportunities, both um, walking, biking, hiking, as well as rock climbing is, is one of the kind of main takeaways from our raptor habitat management program. So and now I just want to pivot into the soundscape stuff because it's it's new to me, it's new to us, and I, I kind of, although it doesn't really fit into the to the uh, topic of raptor habitat management, I kind of felt like the audience would be would be pretty interested in this stuff, and it's it's new. So, um, so we we have kind of been thinking about this for quite some time, just to get a, get a baseline of ambient noise on city open spaces. We bought these two acoustic monitoring devices a couple of years back and deployed them for about 30 days um, in September. Um, and so we, we worked with Na uh, Natural Sounds Night Skies Division at National Park Service, as well as the listening lab at CSU. So they had this kind of whole um, kind of um, process and kind of a churning out of how they get this, these sound data, how they process them and how they provide a uh, summary and an er interpretation. So it's 30 days of continuous recording, but they only use eight days from that. And then even from that eight days, they take 10 seconds of every two minutes of that. So they had these methods down, which we were kind of unaware of, but this has all been kind of vetted inter in internally in NPS to, um, to decrease the amount of variability in what they're detecting and be more confident than that what they're summarizing is actually what's happening on the ground. So yeah, we contracted with the listening lab at CSU and, and largely what National Park Service started doing this for was uh, the education folks at NPS, like when a ranger provides a program, um, they were seeing more and more of those programs get interrupted with propeller plane noise or jet noise or, or some disturbance. And so that was their original metric was how loud does it have to be for a ranger led program to have to halt their program, wait till the noise stops and then kind of rejoin it because it was a visitor experience impact. So that was their original metric was like, okay, if you can't hear the program, then let's start measuring this. And from that, then they kind of started, NPS started and, and other uh, academic researchers started impacts to wildlife and what that would mean not only to um, visitors and, and listening to a ranger led program, but what, how does this impact wildlife ecology and wildlife behavior? And so that started a whole new kind of academic facet of studying impacts to birds and impacts to mammals and predator prey dynamics. So it started with road noise um, and then it turned into plain noise over Grand Canyon and then plain noise over Yosemite. 
But here are just kind of the some of the some of the ones that developed from this original visitor experience impact was the foraging ability um, of birds of mammals increases the search time. And so if you can't hear and you can't detect, it increases the amount of time that you have to look for food, which decreases um, your success. Uh, the prey species ability to hear predators approaching and so that would impact predator prey dynamics and the one that's kind of come to more forefront in the past five or eight six six, six years was um, the ability for birds to hear each other and attract mates um, you know obviously birds sing to uh, defend their territory to attract mates and if there's a lot of noise what does that do to um, you know the ability for males to defend territories and and find females so there's a lot, a lot of um, research on this now uh, that I'm not going to get into, and I'm, I've just actually started to, to crack the surface of. But it's really interesting, and and I, I think it's, I think it's helpful for us as as habitat managers to to know more about noise impacts on on wildlife. So we had two of these acoustic monitoring devices. Um, deployed on open space again for 30 days in September of 01. One was um, on the backside of South Boulder Peak and the other one was um, at White Rocks open space, which is east of 75th. So kind of a louder, less loud maybe um, spot just to learn more about ambient noise. This location, South Boulder P Peak had a, a two track road nearby, but didn't have a trail nearby. Um, Whereas White Rocks didn't have that either. It was closer to 75th, but it's also closer to Boulder Municipal Airport. So we wanted to learn kind of what, what, how much noise did white, do those White Rocks bald eagles and, and other wildlife at White Rocks um, really experience? So um, this is the one, this is a bar graph from the South Boulder uh, Peak um, acoustic monitoring device. And in blue, you'll see the percent of time by hour that commercial jet noise was detected. So the listening lab, again, would take 10 seconds out of every two minutes and humans <clears throat> would code that. So prop, no, prop plane noise, jet noise, other wildlife. So they had like a whole list of what they were, li what they were listening to in those two seconds and kind of plug that in. So they went through um, you know, I think it wound up being 32 hours worth of listening to our 30 days of recording. So he here you'll see um, the commercial jet by hour, you know, getting up to 40%, uh, eight o'clock um, and, you know, closer to 50%, um, 8 a.m. and 8 p.m., 20th hour. Um, so I, we think that when DIA kind of diverted their traffic because of South Boulder Tail Mesa comments, that that really impacted um, the route that DIA um, jet plane jet pl jets flew over open space. We don't we don't we didn't sample it beforehand, but it does seem like at least anecdotally when we've been doing surveys out there that eight years ago there wasn't there wasn't a lot of this type of noise. So you'll see this commercial jet in blue and the prop plane in pink. So this kind of um, more wilderness had had a lot more commercial jet noise coming from DIA, but a lot less prop plane as you'll see as compared to White Rock. So still, you know, nine o'clock, 10 o'clock, 20% of the time you hear prop plane noise. But when you look at White Rocks, um, you'll see almost um, from the hours of eight to you know, 5 p.m., um, we're upwards of 45 to 70 percent of the time um, that you're hearing um, propeller plane noise. So um, this wasn't surprising. It's near the airport. Um, we found while doing bird surveys and other amphibian surveys out there that, you know, one of the attractions when you fly, fly when you take off from Boulder Muni is to kind of fly over White Rocks and see that that formation and, and fly the creek corridor. So not a big surprise, except for, you know, the number, I would have thought that it would be closer to 45% during that time, but, but it was, it was 70. So, um, so yeah, how do we use these data? And, and so um, Boulder Airport, Boulder Municipal Airport is now engaged in a community conversation where they're taking feedback from citizens. Um, 
on how to um, manage their operations or what they want to see out there. Um, it does seem like maybe some of this stuff is a little hamstrung with the FAA with, in terms of what can be done, but it is important, um, at least for us as internally, you know, because this is a city owned facility and city managed facility that, um, that we as uh, open space staff um, stay involved because of the potential impacts to wildlife and, and visitor experience. So some of the things that kind of came out um, as ideas um, from other research that I've looked into is establishing noise budgets. So um, you would you would instruct the um, the pilots not to fly over a certain area at a certain um, time frame, whether it's night or day, or whether there's some sort of budget where you know. Um, at certain times of day, you can't stop your stop your engine and restart it, or you can't fly in circles, or you know some of these ideas of um, mitigating some of the noise impacts to our our natural lands, our open spaces. Um, I hope we can continue the conversation with with the airport on. So we we did um, use that the original soundscape study, as I said, was listening lab and natural sounds night sky staff. So that was part of our funded research program at Open Space and Mountain Parks, and we just funded another one in this cycle um, from Scott Taylor's lab at CU that's looking at um, imp in impacts of anthropogenic noise on 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 songbirds on o OSMP, and so. They're looking at bird species richness in noisy areas and not noisy areas, but also as part of that, they're um, listening and, and coding and quantifying the percent of um, plane noise that they hear when they're listening to their recording. So whereas the previous study was only our first attempt um, at, at getting more information, we're, we're really hopeful that, that Scott Taylor's lab will increase our understanding of of airplane noise on, on open space. So when we met with the with the uh, PhD at, at the listening lab, he turned us on to um, something that National Park Service has done just just recently, um, and and I don't know a, um, a ton about it. I've I've um, taken a couple of trainings in this already, and it's it's a little over my head in terms of physics and decibel levels and um, those frequencies and amplitude and those sorts of things, but. In terms of in terms of this acoustic monitoring, you can provide you can calculate what's called acoustic biodiversity indices, and so this would be a measure um, of the um, the amount of um, time that the recording is between the audible range of bird song, basically. And so when when we were talking to Jacob Job, who who did the the soundscape studies for us at the listening lab, he said. You know, this is kind of a new way for the National Park Service is looking at this on uh, uh, ambient noise data is trying to pull in, you know, what what's called like the biodiversity frequency um, from their recordings. And so it it can be calculated. And so what we try to do um, was use some of our recordings, some of our acoustic monitoring recordings to get this measure. And I'll I'll describe it in a, a little bit. But what I what I want to say here is there's now like 16 or 25 of these different bioacoustical indices out there that are um, both tell you different things. Um, and, and we're still, this is nascent enough, new enough where um, there's not one index where a lot of researchers use. They're still trying to publish comparisons and, and um, differences in, in measurements and, and that sort of thing. But it seems to us that what, has been now kind of moved forward is this acoustic complexity index or what they refer to as, as ACI. And so again, so that you get a score um, and it's based on the difference in amplitude. And I'm just reading this because it's it's new between one sample and the next within a frequency band relative to the, to the total amplitude. So if you have the bioacoustic range of birds between two and eight, you measure the amount of, um, of um, time that that recording is within that bioacoustic range and it provides a, a continuous score. So for instance, you have five, five bird species in your survey one, right? That would provide you a score. But then if you have 
those bird species plus others, there should be more of that kind of um, space taken up in that frequency band because there's more bird song. Um, you know, these are all dawn chorus recordings. And so you would have more space in that in that in that time frame that would be taken up in, in this bioacoustic range. So pretty interesting stuff, um, kind of a cutting edge situation. Hopefully it doesn't all keep us at our desks and we'll look, we get to get outside a little bit more. But so they did, they've done a couple of these studies of co uh, combining acoustic indices versus point counts. And so this study um, a recorded Don Chorus and then brought the Don Chorus recording back and had professional ornithologists um, note how many species they, they just heard from that recording. So not having somebody out there live, but actually bringing the recording back and having somebody listen to it. And so what they found was um, if you combine all of these different acoustic indices, you kind of have this, um, you know, this, this jump. And so this is the variance explained. You kind of have this jump and then it plateaus up to about 60 or 65% of the variation. So what this means is that if you combine all of the acoustic indices, you'd get to be about 60% of what the variation would be in a human point count. So they think that's not bad. Um, I would say that 80 would be better, but um, it's kind of an interesting way to look at things when you start looking at these comparisons of human sampled point counts versus um, just kind of this frequency range. So um, what we try, what we did um, is we uh, we had this was just last year. Now we deployed two of these acoustic monitoring devices at multiple locations on on OSMP, and so we recorded the dawn chorus, dawn chorus a half hour before sunrise to about nine o'clock, and then the Wildlife Acoustics is a company out of Massachusetts, and they make this um, software that you can run these um, noise files through and produce these acoustic indices. And so it, it's what we did is we chop, chopped them up into half hour um, chunks and then Kaleidoscope Pro actually chunks them into one minute um, segments and uses those one minute segments to provide an acoustic index score for each one minute of recording time. So um, Michael, I don't know if you can press play on those. So these. These are two one minute clips, one from the Wanaka grassland just north of Highway 128. You can hear 128. Can you hear a on there? So the one thing about these is it does, I mean, this was four or 500 meters from 128 and it picked up a lot of traffic. So they are very um, sensitive, the recording devices. And so that was Wanaka in the grassland. And then this is the one on uh, Lipitacot Ranch, which is a jointly purchased property with, with Jefferson County open space.
So one, the one thing that's interesting about these is, um, you know, usually when we do point counts, we have to sit and rest for two minutes because we've just walked through the sampling circle. Um, and, and this allows you to just kind of record ambient noise without being there, just similar to remote trail cameras where you don't have to be there and it captures, uh, ca it passively captures wildlife views. So we're, you know, it, it's, it'll be an interesting situation this summer. Um, I, we have a couple of other um, spots that we'd like to try out. And I, and I actually think that this would be cool to put on our website as something that, you know, if you don't get out in nature a lot and you kind of want to hear that type of stuff, it's it's an opportunity to to hear what it's like out there. So um, anyway, I ran this through um, through a two-way ANOVA uh, where you had ACI, which is Acoustic uh, Complexity Index, the metric I, we were just talking about, and then these different um, sampling locations, Erdl, Lindsay, Jeffco, Lippincott that we just listened to, Springbrook, and, and Wanaka were the Lippincott and Monica were, were the two ones that we listened to. And so you can see the difference in um, a significant difference. Uh, the means are represented by the by the green line with the standard errors um, uh, comprising the kind of diamond shape there. But you can see um, the differences in ACI values be among these these different um, locations on on open space. So, uh, some pretty interesting stuff. We'll, we'll continue to do it. I, I, I know it's not about raptors, but it was, it was pretty cool to, to look into some of the songbird stuff as a different way to, to um, create a proxy for uh, habitat quality and, and wildlife um, uh, habitat quality. So I think one of the next steps that we'd like to do is um, actually have um, somebody out there recording point counts and have this ACI, have this acoustic monitoring device out there and actually try to correlate those two. Because I do think that, you know, the more species richness you have, the more packed in that frequency band is during that one minute, um, during that one minute time frame. So I think that's what we're trying to kind of figure out is, is there a relationship between species richness or species abundance and these ACI values? So with that, I that is it. If, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to to answer any of them. Thanks. Thank you, Will. So thank you very much. Sure. That was a wonderful talk. Do we have um, any questions here in the audience? About the uh, the last. Was, um, I'm not quite understanding. Is the uh, obviously the looking looking cock weren't hearing? You could hear the birds more than you could at Monica, mm -hmm. and that's because of traffic. We're not quite sure whether it's because of traffic or because it's just abundance. The the Lippincott um, location was at an ecotone of shrubs and meadow, and you could hear the black-headed grosbeak in there. Um, you could just you could hear more species than just kind of the grassland suite of vesper sparrows and grasshopper sparrows and, and meadowlarks. So it may be a relationship between distance to road because 128 does still have Jake breaks and it's a loud road versus, um, you know, Lippincott that does have the UP train rolling through there, but that's a lot less noise in, in, a, in a spread out time frame. But yeah, it might be a difference in, in habitat type too. We haven't done that yet, no. Um, this is new enough for us where um, we were interested in just kind of running this ACI stuff and seeing if there was a difference among properties that we deploy these, these um, devices in. But I'm sure, I mean, I think you could. Um, you know, if that's how the one study did it was they brought the recordings back and had an, you know, a wildlife ecologist code which species they heard that many times. and try to relate that back to some of these acoustic indices. Any other questions here? Yes? Um, 
the type of tax, which is what I think we're all about here. Um, I'm a little bestie in the White Sox, and they just we want to change the product and sign them. And the restoration that they did, I wonder if that would apply to those same offers of restoration here, which they did in the Green Street area. We, we need to repeat the question. Okay. So the question was um, an acknowledgement of um, the importance of spatial buffers and timing and temporal buffers for cliff nesters and whether that was um, applied to the restoration project on at the White Rocks. Is that so? Yeah. Um, so in conjunction with Colorado Parks and Wildlife, um, you know, they funded half of that or a quarter of that project. And, um, you know, what we worked with them on was protecting the court, the half mile buffer around the um, active nest, around the occupied nest. And so it was kind of a, it was a little bit of a decision where in conjunction with the federal government, what constituted in an active nest and occupied nest because they were nest building in the in the cold nest they were nest building in this new earl nest they that they hadn't nested in before and so it was it was an interesting situation once we realized i think that the pair was new and that they might have been kind of um um not vested in one nest or the other because last year they were one pair of eagles was successful at that cold nest and they had you know a red tail had used that turtle nest before what uh, during mm -hmm. yeah the cold nest yep semi oh colb it's a prop S sorry it's a property pro sorry property names <laughs> Yeah, no, yeah, they were successful at that 75th Street nest last year. And so that's what we were buffering uh, on. Um, when they when they started to um when they started to build that other nest up, then we needed to talk with the state and the feds about what to do. And so we were following their guidelines. And yeah, it was, it was it, we were out there for four hours a day watching that pair, and it wasn't easy on us as staff to, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so the uh, Zoom audience can't hear you. Uh, I don't oh. know if you can try to. Uh, no, that's okay. Yeah, I think um, the comment was it is the female still from last year, and did she choose that? Because I would have thought if the female was not new, that she would have chosen. Um, the nest that she was successful in last year. At least that's been my experience studying eagles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I, I think what would have been, um, um, better was that the permitting could have come in earlier so that we weren't anywhere near the area during the eagle nesting season. Yeah, but it, yes, it, it, we could have postponed it to the fall was was the other question. But um, but then if that eagle nested there on that earl nest, you know, during that time frame, it would have been, yeah, it was it was it was challenging. So we have a question from the Zoom audience. Um, I used to see a pair of eagles on the Stratty Klein pasture east of the airport. They nested in a large cottonwood. I haven't seen them this year. Will the program expand to areas outside of the mountains? Yes, yeah, so the um, bald, bald eagles are, yeah, there's a new nest east of 61st along Boulder Creek. Um, I think that's what I was trying to get at with the grassland raptor monitoring um, that we do monitor burrowing owls and osprey and bald eagles outside of the the cliff nesters. But yeah, they uh, that last check they had one eaglet, uh, maybe two, and yes, staff is monitoring that pair. 
Okay, that's great. Uh, any other question here? We have another one here. Um, I want to shift from nesting to foraging. And obviously the... the um... Oh, uh, yes, the question from the audience, thank you, is, uh, well, here, let me give you the um, microphone. <laughs> if we're to shift from the nesting to the foraging for the for the birds that are nesting in the flat irons there i'm assuming over the last 20 30 years they have not foraged specifically on osmp lands but I know the lands out to the east where I assume they're foraging has been developed. So how are you assessing or are you assessing? And at what point will we know whether there's enough foraging land left to support all the nests that you've reported on? Yeah, I mean, that might be one of the factors in and then decrease in numbers of nesting attempts for each of these species per year. I mean, you know, we do the East County route um, for BCNA raptor route and for overwintering, you know, and obviously have, have seen Boulder County, Eastern Boulder County um, get developed a lot. Um, you know, in terms of, you know, what we can do, I think we can just work with our partners at NREL and Rocky Flats and, you know, at least the open spaces surrounding the city of Boulder to improve uh, raptor foraging habitat. And whether that is, um, you know, managing prescriptive grazing a little bit more effectively. Uh, I do know that the Marshall Fire impacted our ability to move cows around the system because of all the fences that were burned. And so that might have had a, had some impact on um, refuge available for small mammals in some of our grasslands. You know, just some of those types of uh, prey management techniques, I think, is is what um, we could do to improve or maintain the quality of the foraging habitat. Because, you know, um, for better for worse, you know, city open space can't purchase. Um, a lot, a lot more property, and and you know that that too, Karen. So, um, you know, we're kind of at at manage at manage what we can and manage what we have um, in in terms of getting a better prey base. But yeah, I mean, when you're looking towards drought, when you're looking towards um, you know surrounding Eastern Boulder County being more developed, it's 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 a cumulative situation. Given the research data on how much foraging acreage the suite of raptors need? Don't forget, we have to repeat that. Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, do, do we have any data on what raptors need in terms of foraging area? Or a sense of it based on the research about it. Here, let me give you this. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, oh, go ahead. I'm assuming that in the research literature, there's information about the amount, the, the extent of a foraging habitat. Yeah, there's what's called a, um, a core area and a, and a home range. Okay, but, so if you took that kind of data from the literature, could you see whether there's enough public lands that are now preserved to support the raptors that are nesting in the Flatirons area? I mean, I think you could get a general sense of it, but it also depends on the habitat quality of the home range, right? If you have a 66 um, square kilometer home range because there's not a lot of habitat there, you could have the same pair just need three miles, you know, three kilometers home range because there's abundant prey and abundant roosting opportunities and everything they kind of need in a small area. And I think that's what at least, um, I was trying to get at with the density and looking at it uh, from an aerial was these birds are packed in the flat irons because they're such a high quality resource for nesting. Now, what we what it turns into for foraging, you know, maybe um, impacts their nest success. But at least 
you know, in terms of the seasonal closure time frame, we're we're protecting their nest sites as best we can from human disturbance. Thank you. I'm glad you're looking at the foraging questions because it may have bearing on some of your graphs. Sure. Thank you, Karen, for your questions. We have a couple of questions in from the chat. Um, one of them is, uh, I doubt if the pilot community will abide by voluntary measures. Can the city enforce, enforce noise regulations? Yeah, that'll be part of the conversation with the airport manager. I can't speak towards that. Um, it, it did seem just in our brief conversation that they were willing to collaborate and coordinate on that. So I'm, I'm hopeful that we can at least come to some, um, some recommendations. Now, where, whether city council approves of that or not is up to them, but you know, at least internally, we could have those conversations on what, what noise levels are out there as ambient noise on open space. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And then one more, uh, it was an earlier chat question. Does the soundscape data provide sound levels, decibels? Yes. Yeah, it does. Um, we'll release there the report that the listening lab, um, submitted to us on our website um, in the next week or so. So that'll be publicly available. So it'll have decibels and kilohertz and stuff that I, I really have don't understand. So there's 20, 25 pages of it. And I just showed the easy to understand bar graphs on percent of time. So if you want to dive into decibels and kilohertz and frequency bands and amplitude and all those physics things that I can't follow very well, what more than welcome to. Okay. Um, I have an announcement I uh, forgot to make earlier, which is uh, next month. Our talk is uh, Steve Jones will be presenting uh, birds of the birds and wildlife of the Sandhills of Nebraska. So we encourage you to come. And I'd like to thank Will again for just a most excellent talk. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Thanks. <laughs>